Hey, good afternoon. We've got the first of two lectures on the antebellum self. Uh, this one is called the Cotton Revolution. And just remember, the word antebellum, that just means pre-war. So we're talking pre-Civil War self. Okay. Now we're talking about 1800 to 1860 here, right before the Civil War. And pioneers are going to quickly spread west throughout the south. Uh, remember, originally people were just living along the coast. Then you've got the Indian Removal Acts of the 1830s, and white settlers start to move further and further west. There are white settlers in Alabama and Mississippi as early as the 1830s. You've got white settlers in Louisiana and Texas in the 1840s. And then Texas is going to be a whole new story in the 1840s and 50s that we'll talk about in another lecture. Most of these pioneers are what we would call herdsmen. I mean, they've got sheep and cows and things like that, or they're independent farmers. And a word you're going to see later in this lecture is the word yeoman. Yeoman means independent farmers. Now, why are these people moving? Well, it's because of population growth along the coast. There's nowhere for these people to live anymore. So they have to go and find new land to farm and new land to raise their animals on. It's also going to become very expensive to live along the coast because that's where the best farmland is and the big planters are going to get that. Now, most of these pioneers are going to move into wooded areas similar to where we are here in North Georgia. It's not very conducive to slavery. It's not very conducive to cotton farming. If you're in Carrollton, yes, there was some slavery, but it was very small. If you're in Troop County, there was some slavery, but it was very small. Uh, Douglas County and further north, there was almost no slavery. <clears throat> now, cotton is going to become king. Cotton is going to fuel the growth of the South. And one of the biggest reasons cotton becomes so important is Eli Whitney. In 1793, Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin, which is this machine where you could take the little cotton puffs known as cotton bowls. That's B-O-L-L, -L, cotton bowls. And you can put the cotton into these into this machine, you can turn a crank, and the cotton is stretched out, which would allow the seeds to fall down into a bucket. Now, why is that so important? Well, before Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, people in the South were growing something called long staple cotton. Long staple cotton, from my understanding, only had one seed in it. It was a fairly large seed, almost like a pit, and it was easy to remove from the cotton bowl. Uh, long staple cotton, it is better quality, it is softer, it is still grown today, but it would only grow in certain places. It had to have a long growing season, and here in the United States, the only place you could really grow long staple cotton was right on the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. Short staple cotton, it has multiple small seeds. Uh, short staple cotton is what you mostly find in the South today. If you've ever been to South Georgia or have family in South Georgia, you might know what type of cotton I am talking about. It's got a bunch of short little sticky seeds. It was too hard for laborers or slaves to pull out all the seeds, so you didn't grow that until Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin and suddenly it's easy to get all those seeds out. So the cotton gin is going to spread the growth of cotton throughout the southeast because now you can switch to short staple cotton. It's also going to expand slavery. Where cotton goes, slavery follows. Between 1820 and 1860, there are over 2 million Africans who are either forcibly moved into the Gulf States region or they are sold into the Gulf States regions. So that's a lot of people on the move. Now, why is there such a spread of cotton? Why is cotton in demand? Well, in England, they have just done the Industrial Revolution and England gets over 70% of all of its cotton from the southern United States. Seven out of every 10 bales of cotton that go to England are from the U.S. On top of that, you have the New England cotton mills, like those Lowell mill workers that we talked about earlier with the women workers. 
And then cotton is going to spread right when there's a crash with tobacco prices. And a lot of farmers are looking for a new cash crop so that they can continue making money. Social relations in the White South are very important. Uh, Southern society, it's this real mix of aristocratic, er, I can't talk, wow, aristocratic and democratic elements. It's this pre-modern, modern thing. There's still a form of feudalism in the South, even though feudalism died hundreds of years ago. There's a lot of land ownership, and there are these different social classes. The planter class is usually defined as having 20 or more slaves. This is your stereotypical plantation owner you've probably seen in movies. They only made up about 5% of the population, but they easily control the most land because they have the most money. Planters in real life are very different than planters you see in the movie. In movies, you see them as having the biggest houses, the best dress, all this fancy stuff. In reality, they're very often in debt because they're always buying and selling land because they want more land, they want better land, and they want to maximize their profits. The plantation mistress, meaning the lady of the house, is going to actually run much of the day-to-day -day business of the plantation because the plantation owner is always out trying to maximize his profits and get that better land. The plantation plantation mistress she's going to run the household she's going to serve as her husband's deputy she's going to be in charge of raising the kids and there's this real double standard that happens in planter society uh, women are put on this pedestal women are made into this almost religious figure and it's actually a means of controlling women if women are seen as these ethical creatures who can do no harm they're not going to do any harm because they need to maintain that image. Another double standard comes with sexual relations. It was okay for a male planter to sleep with a female slave. That was perfectly fine and happened all the time. Even Thomas Jefferson's guilty of that. But when a wife of a planter slept with a male slave, it demonized the woman and made her almost less human. Your next group are small slaveholders. They are considered as owning fewer than 20 slaves. They're more numerous than planters, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the white population, and they control the second most land. And they're kind of like the swing vote, if you will. When small slaveholders live among planters, they live more like the planters. If the small slaveholders live among the yeoman farmers, then they're going to act more like the yeoman farmers. They're kind of the middle between all of these different groups. They can go either way. They could act more like the planters and act more like the farmers. The important thing is they have slaves. They're trying to break into that planter class. That is their overall goal. They're still looking for better lands and better profits, but they don't have as much money to spend on buying land. Your largest group are the yeoman farmers. They make up somewhere around 60 to 65% of the population. Uh, they typically don't own any slaves. They're going to be in what would be called the uplands. They're away from the plantation belt. Yeoman farmers are what you're going to find mostly in northern and northwestern Georgia. Uh, they're going to own their own farms. Their farms can be anywhere from 50 to 200 acres. During harvest time, they may be able to afford hired help or they may be able to afford to rent a slave from somebody. But for the most part, yeoman farmers are going to do all of their own work. And then lastly, we have poor whites. Uh, poor whites make up about 10% of the population. They can be found anywhere. They can be found in the coast. They can be found in the uplands. They can be found in the plantations. They don't own any land. They don't own any slaves. They're usually squatters, meaning they don't have a permanent place to live, or they're laborers on other farms. Poor whites can be hired by small slaveholders. Poor whites could be hired by the yeoman farmers. Poor whites can be even uh, employed by the planters. They're very self-sufficient. They're very independent. 
The planters are going to control society. They only make up 5% of the population. They are by far the smallest population. But they have the most control over Southern society. A lot of people want to know why. Well, the small slaveholders, they want to be planters. And if they ever become a planter, they want to be in good with the planters. They want to have been an ally to the planters. So the planters accept them if they ever make it to that next step. Yeoman farmers might get help from the planters. Yeoman farmers might be able to borrow a slave or rent a slave. Yeoman farmers might be able to get money from the planters. They might be able to get assistance from the planters. So they look up to the planters. And then poor whites, they may work for the planters. Slavery is all about control. And I'm going to talk more about that on Thursday's lecture. But white Southerners, they want to keep control over African Americans. And African Americans during the time were seen as an inferior race of people. This is where race turns from being what country you're from more to what the color of your skin is. That happens a little bit quicker in the United States than it does in the rest of the world, but that is a change that's being made in the early 1800s into the middle of the 1800s. The best means of controlling blacks was to treat them inferior. And the idea of having African Americans as laborers for other people, meaning having African Americans as slaves, meant that all whites were equal, even though some were more equal than others. In the South, this whole pro-slavery argument is constructed and becomes the way that people think. And some of the readings for this week are about those pro-slavery arguments, and they're just crazy. Um, Southerners taught themselves that slavery was a positive good for both blacks and whites. They say that black slaves are given free food, black slaves are given clothing, black slaves are taken care of. In reality, they're not being taken care of, of course. They're being very mistreated and psychologically ruined, so to speak. Uh, slavery, they say, was sanctioned by history and religion. Yes, slavery is found in the Christian Bible. Yes, slavery is found in Greek and Roman times and in, in Muslim times, etc., etc. But the slavery was very different then, and they didn't really stop to think about that. And then they even say that slaves are treated better than northern wage workers because northern wage workers work for these slave wages and they have to still pay for their own clothing and their own house and their own food and take care of their families where black slaves have everything handed to them. And last but not least, southern churches are actually preaching support for slavery all the way up into the Civil War. So you could go to a white southern church and you could hear preachers talking about all the good of slavery and how it was okay religiously to have slaves. And a lot of support for slavery is found in southern churches of the time. That's a very interesting time in the South as far as racial relations go. And on Thursday's lecture, we'll talk about what slave life was like in the South and give you that point of view as well. Now, as promised, secret word of the day is rain because it is raining here right now. There are two secret words, one today and there is one on Thursday. You have to do both to get full credit on that secret word quiz. Now a quick word about spring break. You might see on the course calendar that there is no spring break anymore. The college has taken that out and made it an instructional week. That's to make up for the week that we were closed. But in reality, it's not going to change that much because you can't go anywhere and you're going to be working from home at your own leisure. The only thing, once again, is to remember all of your discussions, quizzes, anything that is due is due on Sunday nights. The secret word quiz will be opened up on Thursday after I do my 
second video lecture. And so make sure that you do watch both videos and get both secret words. They are different, both of the lectures. All right, until next time, have a good day. We'll see you soon.